I'd like to invite you to begin by opening your New Testaments back into the book of Hebrews, this time around chapter 11. Tonight we, we will briefly kind of review what we've covered in chapters 10 and 11, and then we will spend our time walking through the layout of Hebrews chapter 12. I really appreciate you coming on this journey with me of what is three lessons, and maybe we'll throw in a little Hebrews 13 next week, we'll see. But you might be surprised to learn that I, I thought this is going to be one sermon, all of it, and just make you sit there and see what happens. And uh, I showed it to some people who, who advised me to break it into pieces, but in that way, you've had to kind of come along the journey, and I, I really appreciate that. I'm going to show you a couple things about this that we've covered so far. These are basically just the slides that we've looked at. We saw these two beautiful ideas in Hebrews 10 last Sunday, that in verse 10... Jesus lived in a body just like yours, and he offered that body so that we could be sanctified. Verse 14, it is possible in Jesus for us to be perfected for all time. This is not possible through anyone but Jesus. It is not possible through your individual or our collective goodness or rightness. It was not possible by the Israelites through the law of Moses and bazillions of animals that were sacrificed over the years. Only through Jesus is it possible. But there is a warning. The warning has been a centerpiece of our study over the last week that in verse 26, people who are redeemed, people destined for heaven like you and me can lose that destiny if we choose to go on sinning willfully. So in the morning lesson last week, we went into Hebrews 10 and thought, I don't want to sin willfully. Help me, God, build a life that does not get caught in that trap. What kinds of things must I be dwelling on, thinking on and feeling? in order to live a life that seeks righteousness. And that's where we looked at this list. This came directly from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and following. We approach God with the right attitude. We seek for purity. We constantly confess who he is and who we are, and we work together as a family. So we went through a lot of that, and it reshapes just the kind of decision-making that we make. And so we came back this morning, and we moved forward into the rest of chapter 10 and 11 and thought, okay, when you really break it down, if I not only commit sin, which we all battle with, we all do that, but if I not only commit sin, I start practicing sin. I decide that I can accept sin in my life. What's really going on that would allow me to do something like that? And so we saw three very sobering things. I can think of no more extreme way of wording what happens in the life of a believer when they can live in sin and not run from it. But graphically speaking, here's what's happening. To run to that sin, I'm walking right over the body of the Son of God to do so. To embrace sin and live in a way that I see the Bible teaches me not to. And maybe in some twisted concept that grace is going to cover all my sins because I'm a Christian would be completely casting aside the blood of Jesus, the covenant that he ratified by that blood and the cleansing that I experienced through baptism. And then I think maybe this stuck more than the other two from the comments after services today, but I'm carrying the Holy Spirit around with me and I cannot put him in compromising situations. The Spirit is so patient. The fact that he would be in me for any amount of time says much more about his patience than it does my goodness. But for me to habitually decide that I will walk my journey and the Spirit's just going to have to tag along is blasphemy against the integrity of the Holy Spirit. Did Jesus ever talk about that? I didn't mention that in this morning's lesson, but did Jesus ever talk about what life's going to be like for you if you decide to blaspheme the integrity of the Holy Spirit? He calls it the what? Unforgivable sin. There is nothing so extreme as that. And so our concept was, let's not just make decisions this week and kind of see how they go. Become the kind of person who understands the nature of your decisions that they're always bigger than the exact thing that you're doing because they represent the you that is doing it and the faith that is in you. Now, what we finished with today is that there's something we can do that can help so much with this. What will help is becoming the kind of people who think about Jesus, read about Jesus, look towards Jesus and seek Jesus every day, which we know pretty well, and we have got to draw our view toward heaven. Have the decisions, it's just a Sunday, we'll do a little sample size. Have the decisions that you have made today helped your family see heaven? Have the conversations that you have had today, this weekend, 
Have they represented that you are living for someone better than yourself and some place more than where you live today? I told you under the law of Moses, it was very tit for tat in the physical realm. You do good physically, you get physical gifts, but that's not the world we live in. God may gift you physically with prosperity and freedom and health, or he may not. We're living for something more. There was a lot of um, hidden self-confession in my tone this morning. I've been a Christian for a long time. I've spent a lot of time singing and proclaiming that I'm living for heaven. Heaven is all that it's about. About, but not a whole lot of time walking consistent with that statement. You know why? Because it's hard. It's really, really hard. You're walking around in a physical body with physical relationships in a physical, in a kind of an awesome physical world, if I can just be honest. Lots of great things around us. It's very difficult to walk in that way in this world. So you know what I think? I think we need some help. I think we need God to come in and say, let me help you get your eyes beyond the horizon. Let me help you live for something more so that you will make decisions that amount to something more. And that's what puts us tonight in Hebrews chapter 12. You're going to get lots of help tonight. If you say, that all sounds wonderful, it would change the way I spend my money, it would change the way I spend my time, it would change the way I use up conversations. If I could just see heaven's gates everywhere that I go, well, here is the help that we all need. Let's begin by reading verses 1 through 4. Number one, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, on the life that he lived and the life that he now has. Let's read it together. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, you remember those guys, the ones who live by faith because they were living for heaven? Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, I want you to notice that, before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. Jesus did resist and to the point of bloodshed, we have not, nor this Hebrew audience. Here are some things that we need to know. Verse one is the goal. Okay, everybody kind of gets verse one. The goal is I've got to lay aside this sin and live for heaven. The goal is I've got to run this race toward ultimately where I want to go and not get distracted or derailed. Well, get your eyes on Jesus and never take them off. How do we do that? Read the Gospels every year. Read the Gospels every year. Every year of your life, read the Gospels. Read the Gospels with some duration, we'll call it every year. There should not be a year of your life lived that you don't spend it seeing Jesus walking and talking in the same flesh that you possess. That's not a part of the lesson. I threw that in for free. Read the Gospels every year. But what you're going to find is this. Jesus lived in the flesh on the earth, the author and perfecter of faith. And he saw something so joyous in front of him. Think about this. I'm talking about verse two. He saw something so wonderful, so joyous that he walked through anything that he had to walk through to get to it. You say, what did he go through? Death on a cross. Hey, that doesn't really compare to the life we're living. He walked through even death on a cross. He disregarded the sacrifice that he needed to make to get back to heaven. He disesteemed. He disesteemed the shame that was often heaped upon him along the way. And he never lost heart because he knew that God gave him a body for a purpose. Does anybody know why God gave Jesus a body? Why did Jesus get a body? Pause here just a moment. Go back to chapter 10. In chapter 10 and in verse 5, we are told that God planned to give Jesus a body, a body you have prepared for me. In verse 10, we've read this every lesson so far. By this, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once 
for all. Verse 20, a new and living way inaugurated through the veil that is his flesh. God said, here's a body, go live on earth, have friendships, eat good food, enjoy nature and make the most out of your life. But the body is here to be sacrificed so that you can become a place, uh, be in a place of glory again. And so back in chapter 12, verse 2, it's exactly what happened. He had his eyes fixed on where he was going, so even a cross could not stop him from his faith. Despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Folks, we need to focus on Jesus. If you'd have met Jesus at 12 years old and said, man, what's your life going to be like? He said, I don't know, but I'm living for heaven. If you'd ask him at 30 years old, what's this ministry going to be like? You know, it's not a very popular ministry, this thing you're doing. The Jews are going to be really upset and the Romans are going to be really upset. He'd say, I am laying some groundwork so that I can get back to glory and you can get there too. For Jesus, everything was about heaven. Let me rephrase. For Christ, everything was about heaven. So tell me, what's it like being a Christian? I like the little talk. Tony Sellers didn't hear, so I'll say something nice about him. I like the little talk Tony did a couple weeks ago on discipleship, a little short talk they did where he sat down here and was being really cool and stuff. And he talked about how in the first century, if you chose a rabbi, like, they were everything to you. You gave up everything to study them, to imitate them, to be like them. To be a follower of a rabbi in that day, a teacher would be completely abandoning any life except the life that made me more like them. That's what this is supposed to be. Not us live in the flesh for the flesh and then somehow his death takes care of everything for us. We need to be more like Jesus because Jesus and his ability to live beyond this life while still living in it is what made him so beautiful. And that's where your beauty is going to come. Living in this life, but for the one to come. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Read the Gospels every year. Consider the sacrifices that he has made and realize that he did all that so that you could follow in his steps. Well, guess what? It's still really hard. In fact, sometimes it seems a little further away than closer when I read about Jesus. Because I see how sacrificial he was and how he called the disciples to sacrifice. And I think I'm not that guy. I don't know that I have the faith to do that. I like to find my comfort zones, go to my comfortable church with my comfortable people and live my comfortable life in my nice home. And this idea of just like selling out for glory, I don't think I'm ready to do that. God said, I know. So I got a plan for you. Okay, you're not going to love, okay guys, you're not going to love this plan. But it is an effective one. Pick up with me in verse four. God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to discipline you. Raise your hand if you love discipline. Nobody loves discipline. God, is there an undisciplined way to be more like Jesus? I want you to ask yourself that question right now. Is there an undisciplined way for you to make me more like Jesus? The answer is no. So while I don't like discipline from God, I accept the fact that I need discipline from God. So that's what he goes on to talk about. Let's pick up in verse Five, we'll start in verse four and read through verse 11. He said, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. Amen. Sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I need you to discipline me. I'm willing to say this, are you? I get too caught up in what's going on in this life. I get too caught up in the American dream. I get too caught up in myself and my family and how many doubles Nick hits in the gap. 
I get really caught up with that stuff. Those things aren't sinful as long as they come after him. As long as they are secondary, short-term views that momentarily draw a peripheral gaze. But really, heaven is what I'm about. I need help with that. Now, here's the thing. How does God discipline us? Does he give you a spanking? That's what we used to call it. Is that what he does for us? Well, you know what? Bad things happen in this life. Bad things happen to good people. We want to know why bad things happen to good people. Why do good people get sick? Why do the people that good people love pass away? Why do bad things happen to us economically? Why do bad things happen to us politically? Why do other people hurt us? There are all these things, and I don't know who's doing all of it. I'm going to just confess to you. So nothing seems to frustrate people more than when the preacher says he doesn't know. I don't know. I don't know why all bad things happen. I don't know if it's the devil getting a lick in on a Christian. I don't know if it's God at work in some building or reconstructing way. I don't know if it's just gravity doing what gravity does. Or if it's moral evil, people are bad, bad things happen. Or if it's natural evil, that's just the way life goes. But I know this, every hard thing that happens to a Christian is a chance to be changed for God. I know that. I don't have to know if God orchestrated this trouble that you're going through right now. I don't have to know if it was the devil who was allowed to make you feel bad in your flesh. I don't have to know why it happened. I know this. Discipline is when things happen to us that we don't like. But God expects us to use those things to change our view. I'm not always sure what I'm supposed to be learning, though. When things don't go my way and God maybe puts a big no in front of me to all these prayers. I, bet I pray a lot, don't you? And God says no quite a lot. What am I supposed to be learning? Well, one of the things that we learn is that we can learn to bear fruit, verse 11. That God wants to make us better and more holy. But have you thought about this? Maybe the things in your life that happen that you don't understand. Or you can't explain. Or aren't good, quite frankly. Maybe they are designed to get your eyes off the flesh, which clearly is not as reliable as you thought that it was, and on the spirit. Maybe they're designed to draw our gaze away from building these walls of security here. Are we big on that? We're big on that. We're Texans. We're going to build walls of security. We want to build perfect, uh, protection and insulation and we're going to have everything taken care of and bad things aren't going to happen to us. You can do all of that, but God wants you to know those walls can be blown over by a simple western wind. You've got to have securities that go beyond your locks and your doors and your walls. And if I could just get off task a moment, I'm a little bit afraid that churches of Christ in our country are more interested in building the security of what we've got and kind of hunkering down than our real mission, which is to be a little bit vulnerable, a little bit exposed, take a little bit of risk and go save some people. Oh, I just... Too much risk. We've got to stay safe and, and secure and protect. Says who? We're here to save souls and get to heaven. And that means we've got to get rid of all this security emphasis that we have in our time. We were doing some Old Testament study in our Bible survey classes. The Babylonians had the biggest, thickest, most awesomest walls of all wallhood of Wally world. They, they were amazing. Nothing was ever going to happen to them. They had built perfect security and there's nothing even God could do about it. But you know, they needed water and they had a little river that ran underneath the walls. So the enemy just dammed up the river and went under the walls and killed the king while he was sleeping or drunk or both. You know, things happen that shake us, don't they? I've been shaken up this last week, haven't you? You have to have been shaken up by what happened in the school in West Texas this week. By the way, there have been more shootings since then, in case you weren't aware of that. I don't know what to do with that. Is that God? I don't believe that God would do things like that. But God allows things that show us, look, you need to wake up because life is about heaven, not earth. And we need to be emphasizing it over that. It's about laying aside chapter 12, verse 1, these weights that easily entangle us and putting our walk towards glory and looking straight at him along the way. A lot of those weights I attach myself because I feel like I need those things. Discipline 
Is God making things happen in your life that prove to you that there has to be more than the flesh and I need to quit gazing at the wrong things? It reminds me of all these guys. I mean, Hebrews 11, I'll just pick a few of them. How are they able to do this? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, Noah used a hundred years. I mean, he lived a lot longer back then. It'd be like you using 15 straight years and just building a boat when it never even rained. Until after, of course. Hebrews 11, chapter, chapter 11 and verse 8, Abraham, leave your, your homeland and your father and your family and live in a tent for the rest of your 120 whatever years of life. It would be Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17. By the way, Abraham, take the son that I promised you and delivered to you and take him up on a mountain and stick a knife through his heart and end his life out of faith in me. It's Hebrews 11 and verse 24. Moses, who was protected against the slavery that his people were incurring and walked away from Pharaoh in the verses that follow, verses 25 and 26, walked away from that. Because he knew God had bigger, bolder, and more beautiful plans for him. When I read these stories, I think, would I, would I be willing to do any of that? Would I be willing to take most of my life and just build a boat because God said it's going to rain? Would I be willing to walk away from everything I have here and go sojourn in eastern Africa because there are souls there that are hungry for the gospel? Would I be willing to end the life of my son? Thank you, God, for not requiring of me just to show that I believe he can raise the dead whenever he wants to? Would I be willing to give up the fanfare and favor of this country and this world because these pleasures are alluring, but they're passive? The answer is, I don't know that I'm ready. So you know what God says? I will discipline you. I will discipline you. I will make things imperfect in your life. I will allow trials that are insurmountable in your path because you need it. The second thing I want you to understand is God will work in us to help me learn to live beyond this life. Do you know people in the church who, when things get really torrential in their life, they fall away from God because they have that Deuteronomistic, I got it, view of, hey, I'm going to church. Good things are supposed to happen. I go to church on Sunday nights like great things are supposed to happen. And God's like, that's not the way this works anymore. You worship me, I take you to heaven. And they're not ready. I hope that the weight of God's hand changes your view and doesn't break your faith. But he will test it. Now, let me add a third thing to this, because it is still very hard. But one thing that will help is to not just stare in the mirror all the time. Not just be like, oh, I need this. This didn't go my way. I need that. God made these, uh, the stock market crash right when I was about to retire. I, I needed that. That's, that's what I need. That's okay. It's good to have a perspective on what you need. But also remember that it's not just about you. That everybody in this room is trying to do the same thing you're trying to do. And if it's hard for you, it's hard for the person sitting behind you and over on the other row than you. It's hard for us all. And so God says, I tell you how we're going to do this. It's not just going to be me disciplining you and disciplining you and disciplining you. I want you all to find a way to help each other get to heaven. Don't do this by yourself. And that's where we get to this great little section in chapter 12, verses 12 and following. Therefore, discipline is no fun, verse 11. It can be very difficult to break that view, verse 11, but I'm working on you. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification with which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Not just you, you see to it that no one else comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many are defiled, that there be no immoral, verse 16, or godless person like Esau. You guys Remember Esau? Esau sold his future for his present. He, get, he gave up God's generational plan because he was hungry. Does that sound familiar? There are mirrors taped under everyone's pew tonight. Now I would ask you to grab it. Like we do that. We trade in what is coming for what is now. Esau did that. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, now I want it. He was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with many tears. We need to help each other focus beyond this life. I, let me ask you a couple of questions. What, what do you tell a Christian when they're going through a hard time? Here's somebody who comes to you and says, um, 
you know, my wife, uh, my wife left me and I tried to serve God and she left and I don't know what to do. And you say, well, you know what? That's really bad that that happened. But at least you still have your kids and your job and your home and your health. And then she took the kids and you say, well, OK, help. At least you still have your job and your home and your health. And then he gets all depressed and kind of and misses work and he loses his job. Well, at least you still have your home like God is there for you. And then, you know, you have to make payments on the first of the month. So he loses his home. And so you're like, well, at least, hey, things are still OK, because at least you still have your health. Now he's in the hospital. Now, what do you tell him? I guess you just kind of go like uh, I'm out of ideas here. Um, I mean, I guess curse God and die, I guess. I mean, that's the way the Job story went. You just keep stripping physical blessings away and keep going, well, at least you have these other physical blessings. And then they're gone. Well, at least you have these other physical blessings. Until finally, because of our Deuteronomy whatever view of, well, yeah, things should be going well here if you're a good person. Eventually, we just kind of end up running out of things to thank God for. I wonder if we sometimes talk to fellow Christians about that. You're sick. You're mourning loss. You're out of work. You know, uh, just hang in there. Uh, it's all going to be OK. It's going to get better. This isn't God. Stocks are going to go back up. A job will come around. There are other fish in the sea. Modern medicine is doing wonders these days. We're like promising all this physical reboot stuff. You just hang in there and God's going to eventually flip it over for you. Maybe not. I mean, didn't everybody born before like 1905, haven't they died? Is that true? Like every single, like all 52 billion people, you know, they, they act, it wasn't like, oh, just hang in there and it'll all be okay. They died. They're dead. They're gone. You know what I think more Christians need to be telling one another when it says strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and pursue peace and come not short of the grace of God. I think we need to be sitting down with people saying, let's pray about all that. Let's pray that God puts your marriage back together. Let's pray that God gets you a job less, next month. But let's not use all of our time on that. Let's talk about why we're really here. Let's talk about what life is really about. Let's talk about the condition of your soul. Let's talk about the nature of your faith. Let's talk about your yearning for heaven. Let's talk about Jesus. Jesus didn't have almost any of those things and died at a young age. Do you think Jesus is okay? No, he really missed out. Jesus did. Jesus is fine. He died a young man and he's been ruling ever since. Like one of the things that I think Christians need to do a better job of is apocalyptical encouragement. We're going to heaven, okay? That's the best thing that could ever happen to anyone here. And we need to celebrate that and look towards that and yearn towards that. And that's the concept of strengthening the hands that are feeble because wouldn't it be awful, verse 15? Wouldn't it be awful if there is trouble in your life, people treat you poorly, it's not God, let's say, it's just the devil, or God puts some obstacles in your path, try to draw your view to heaven, and, and all these bad things are happening, because bad things do happen here. We live in a body that's wasting away by the millisecond. What a wonderfully encouraging sermon. Wouldn't it be awful if through all of that, not that we lost our health, that wouldn't be awful, not that we lost our family, that wouldn't be as awful. What if we lost the grace of God in all of that? Something designed to put our view more on the grace of God causes us to fall short of the grace of God. We can't let that happen. And some of it needs to be reflected in, in elderships and in sermons and in families. The types of language we use to encourage each other it needs to be spiritual. You need a little help with that? I'm going to get you going. Let me give you a little help as we conclude. If you want a place to start, start in verse 22. You say, oh, I, I've been going through a lot. I guess maybe I need to see this God trying to fix my gaze. Not that he's punishing me. Discipline isn't punishment in this chapter, but discipline is redirection. It's, it's shaping. It's building. It's, it's making better. And you're thinking, I need to get my eyes on what God's really doing. How do I do that? Or, or I need to encourage a brother or sister in Christ. Well, verses 18 through 21 talks about Mount Sinai and the shaking and quaking and lightning and how devastating it was. But that's all just basic shadow stuff, two-dimensional. Pick up with me in verse 22. You, you Christian. This is about Christians. This whole text is about Christians. It's not about people outside of Christ wondering what's going to happen. It's about people who've been baptized into Christ and want to get to heaven. You have come to Mount Zion. 
You have come to the city of the living God. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have approached the myriads of angels and the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and you have come to his sprinkled blood, which speaks better than than the blood of Abel. You in Christ have approached the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the angels, the heavenly realm, and all of the saved who have gone before. It would not hurt the people in this room to at least once a week go somewhere, sit down on your own, close your eyes, I prefer to be standing when I do this, and feel that you are on the foothills of a mountain. You're on it. That's what it means to be in the church but you've not ascended into its upper levels yet. You're on it. So you look around and there are angels fluttering around you and there are faithful souls all about you and you look before you and there is Christ and his shed river of poured forth blood and the Father and all of his revelation glory. This is what it's all about. And it's all around us in the spiritual realm and we experience it now. Question for you. If you were literally given that opportunity right now, you walked out of this door and you thought you were walking out in the parking lot and God just pulled an Ezekiel on you or a John or a Jeremiah and just pulled you up from there and boom, your first step was onto this mountain and there was singing and rejoicing and trumpets and spiritual things. And Jesus from heaven boomed his voice down and said, I died for you and I love you and I believe in you. And here is what I want you to do. Verse 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Is there anybody in the room who would go, ah, uh, I'll think about it. Or, hmm. That's too hard. Or I've got more important, more important things too. There's myriads of angels flying around you right now. Just keep that in mind. I've got more important things to do. Like nobody would do that. And yet a lot of people do that. Why is that? Because our view is not on the mountainside of Zion as often as it should be. It's on this world, this life, and these things. Draw your gaze. See this picture and you not only will not refuse him who is speaking, you will also learn the great gratitude that comes from being in Christ and you can encourage others. Let's finish in verses 28 and 29. Therefore, since we have received a kingdom, and I could go on and talk about this all night, I, I think there's room to argue that you're already on that mountain, that you're assisted by angels at this very moment, that you've experienced the blood of Jesus. He says, therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, here's what we're going to do about that. We're going to show gratitude. We're going to, to offer to God acceptable service with reverence and with awe, for that God is a consuming fire. I'm increasingly convinced that the number one, bestest, most important quality that any believer can have is gratitude. I've been reading this, I'm reading a textbook. Like what's, it's, wow, if that sounds boring, it's because it, it kind of is. I'm reading like an 800 page textbook. I don't know why, I'm on page 110. Check in with me in a few weeks. About Jewish history and Israelite history and first century history and all the kinds of things that were there when the church came into fruition and how it affected the language used in the New Testament. But one thing is sure, their entire society, Roman, Greek, Jewish, Christian, was centered on gratitude. A benefactor would do something kind for someone who had need. And the only thing that was required in response wasn't payback. The only thing was ongoing and unending gratitude. Thankfulness. Telling everybody, going, this, this guy helped me. Ongoing appreciation and gratitude. Faith is gratitude now. Thankfulness to God, holiness to God, seeking closeness with God, reading the word of God, worshiping God, serving the people of God. It's gratitude now so that one day we get to meet in person the one who made it all possible. Faith is gratitude now and what is beyond eternal life. You got to be living for eternal life to live a life like that. 
But when you are, there is a natural outgrowth that will defy the standards of this world. Draw attention to you. And by the way, some of Jesus' sacrifices for the cause were ones that he made voluntarily. And other times it was the world rejecting the life he had chosen. That may happen for you. But we will do it in the name of eternal life. And we will enjoy glory forever as a result of it. You miss heaven. You missed all there is. Who's here tonight with their view just drawn down? Who is burdened by depression? When bad things happen in your life, they crush you. They confuse you. They derail you. Maybe we need to understand that God is trying to recode the way we process the days of our lives to draw our gaze to him. If we can help you with that, if you want to become a child of God tonight and put your foot on that mountain of glory by being washed in the blood of the lamb, the opportunity is extended to you as we stand together and sing.